So welcome to the Compassionate Capitalist Show, of course. And, you know, here's the thing. Water, water everywhere, right? But is it clean? Is it affordable? Is it available? Does it do what it needs, what we need? Up to 60% of the human adult body is water. And according to H.H. H. Mitchell, Journal of the Biological Chemistry 148, in that particular publication, the brain and the heart are composed of 73% water and the lungs are about 83% water. And according to the U.S. Gov, US, USGS.gov, the earth is a watery place. 71% of the earth's surface is water covered and the ocean holds 96.5% of all earth's water. You know, but it's, can't drink it, really. It's it's ocean, right? And water also exists in the air as water vapor and in rivers and lakes and ice caps and glaciers and in the ground as soil moisture and, you know, everywhere, right? Yet according to wild, worldwildlife.org, clean fresh water is an essential ingredient for human life, but 1.1 billion people lack access to water and 2.7 billion experience water scarcity at least once a month. I mean, one, one month a year. And by 2025, two thirds of the world's population may be facing water shortages. The global challenge with water scarcity is being driven by two converging phenomena, growing freshwater use and the depletion of usable freshwater resources. And that is compounded in the US by crumbling resources where our water infrastructure is either inadequately, um, re is, is not adequately claiming the, uh, fresh water from rain and reclaiming or conserving water from agriculture and from all the uses of water. And nor is it cleaning wastewater sufficiently and transporting it safely because it's our pipes sometimes that cause some of the problems. There are things, these are the things that fill our news cycle that many of us are aware of. We, we hear it all the time in the press and, we, and as uh, there's more and more call for, for conservation and environmental impact, we hear about it, right? But the impact of water on commerce, agriculture, and even our financial market is so much more complex. And this is what we do in the Compassionate Capitalist Show is that we educate entrepreneurs and investors out there about things that can happen and impact them financially as, as a critical side of things, but also in a positive way as opportunities. So today you are going to learn about creating wealth by solving the problems that plague our water challenges. Because when my guest, John Robinson, he can say hello here, I'm gonna introduce him. Um, when we got together for a chat a couple of weeks ago, I was blown away, really. I mean, and uh, when you hear what my guest here has to say, you'll also have your aha moments and think, but of course, it's not just something that we think of, but when he talks about what the purpose of the venture capital fund that he started Marizon Ventures, then you're gonna understand how integral is not just in all the things I just said about your body and the world and all this kind of stuff. It's really about commerce and effective commerce. And it's really so much about so many parts of our capitalist system that we don't even think about. It. We totally take it for granted, right? And so, um, I'm just really, really excited to have John here today. And, you know, he, fortunately, John, he joined forces with other very smart and passionate investors to start the, I said it right, correct, Mazarine Ventures, right? right? It's a venture capital firm to do just that. They think about that stuff, the stuff that we're taking for granted. And they are showing how compassionate capitalism works by doing the hard work of not only figuring out the solutions, but also putting their money to work, bringing the innovation to the market and building thriving, sustainable companies in the process of that. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Mazarine Ventures and, and then I'll talk about John and then we'll get started, okay? And we'll dive right in. So and while you're, while you're listening and you're grabbing your pen, MazarineVentures.com, it's M-A-Z-A-R-I-N-E. So like Marine, but with an A-Z stuck in the middle there, okay? Ventures.com. They, are, they back early stage innovations that improve efficiency and manage water and wastewater risk 
Their mission is straightforward. They generate social environmental impact and financial return by investing in early stage technology companies with innovations addressing water related challenges like some of the things we talked about and we're going to learn a lot more about. Across three funds, they seek investment opportunities into companies who bring efficiency and risk management tools to agriculture, conservation, commercial property, heavy and light industry, municipalities, and residential homes. One of the, the we'll go into these deeper, but Nazarene Labs is one of their programs or is focused on skunk works, which we'll, I'm sure we'll hear more about, but it's a whiteboard approach to working with founders and industry stakeholders to explore innovative approaches that, that solve water and wastewater challenges that, you know, people with the real, the jobs in that area are often aren't thinking about it. They're just doing what they think ain't broke and, or ain't broke enough to fix. So, and then fund one is Seed States Tech. And, uh, you know, you learn all about them. I really encourage you to go to mazarineventures.com. They have a list there of the companies that they've already invested in. And there's really technology advan advancements that are kind of like, thank you so much. Cause there's Veriset, which is leveraging DNA profiling tech to accurately detect the source of bacteria contamination. And then there's a company, EQO, which is a breakthrough solution for monitoring and eradicating aquatic invasive species. You know, we hear about these things. So fun two is a data science approach to managing risk in waters. And it's really focused on growth stage companies that we will revisit. So let me tell you about John because he's going to be taking over here and, and explaining a lot of this and, and informing you on it. John is a graduate of the John Hopkins University, Paul H. Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies. He spent nine years working in China as a manager at Motorola and associate director of Cushman Wakefield before settling into Chicago as a consultant for Deloitte and then a dec decade with Mandarin Environment, which is a strategy consultancy with expertise, expertise in, in water and wastewater in China before launch launching the Mazarine Ventures in 2007. So officially, welcome, John. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks, Karen. So now you started Mazarine Ventures while you were still at the Mandarin um, Environment Consulting Group. That, that tells me that your cor corporate experience really showed a spotlight on some of these problems, but it wasn't just enough that funding innovation to solve these problems seems like it was necessary. Is that was, did you have this vision and then and found some people to go started or did somebody come knocking on your door because you were an expert and say hey we want to start this and come and help us with it how did that happen uh yeah so i lived in china for a long time seven years actually i lived there um not nine but seven years i lived in china when you okay. live in china you become acutely aware of environmental challenges that are faced and the air gets a lot of airtime uh, over there. They call it the air apocalypse, and you see it on CNN and the smog. But the water is is equally as challenging. So living over there, I was I was just always aware with the challenges of the water. And I had a home filtration system, and I thought, God, this is a huge opportunity. Someone should clean up the water. But at the time, I was working in real estate, and I didn't really know what to do with my interest in water. But it turns out real estate owners and operators have a lot of headaches relating to water, whether it's filtration or sprinkler systems or pool or irrigation or hot water. I mean, water and dishwashers, wash machines. If you're a real estate owner, either a small real estate owner or commercial property, real estate becomes a headache. So I was kind of aware of that. And then I came back to the U.S. and I was at Deloitte and we had some clients um, that were in heavy manufacturing and industrial. And guess what one of their big challenges is? Water. <laughs> And I never thought about it before because I was just thinking real estate and water. And then some of our Deloitte clients had headaches relating to water in their process, whether it's beer or pulp and paper or some metal metallurgy or manufacturing. Water is an integral part of those processes. So I started to connect the dots. So I left Deloitte to start my own consulting practice called Mandarin Environment, which is a, just like every other consultancy in the world, helping people move something forward or solve some problem. But the problem that Mandarin Environment set out to solve was helping uh, North American and European uh, water, wastewater technology companies get into China and succeed in China. That's what I knew at that point in my okay. life. So I merged my interest in water and technology with my connections and my experience in China. So I was living in Chicago and I was flying back and forth between the US and China 
and our client base was um, companies in Europe and Israel and the US and Canada. And they wanted to get into China, but it's a tough market as you can imagine. So for 10 years, uh, Mandarin Environment helped uh, 30 plus companies get in and succeed. Of, of those companies, some are still there and successful, some are still there and less successful and some have thrown in the towel, so to speak. But as a consultant, you start to learn technologies, you learn uh, the industry, you learn the corporates, you learn the industry landscape. So that was in uh, 2018. Um, I decided to turn the, turn, you know, turn the page or move to the next chapter of my career and start an investment group entirely focused on technologies that address water. So graduating from consultant advisor to investor. Um, and now our investment group doesn't really have any China connection. Um, but I'm still intellectually curious about China, but I'm not doing any business there. So that's how I got from being uh, 20, 20 something year old living in China to today running uh, an investment group. Um, and, you know, Karen, one of the things you said at the beginning that is crucial to all this is that we're technology investors. We wake up in the morning and we're looking at technology that solves water. Right. We're not investing in water itself. Now you can if you want. If you want to invest in water rights, you can invest in literally invest in water. You can buy this stuff. Uh, but we're investing in material science companies, data science companies, um, chemistry companies or microbiology companies that have a technology that improves the efficiency of water or de-risks it somehow, because water is a problem for people if it's contaminated or if there's not enough of it. So that's where, um, so I, that's, I introduced myself as a technology investor, focused on innovations that solve water related challenges. So that's in a sentence, that's what, who I am and what we do. And by doing that, we create a um, significant amount of social and environmental impact. Yes. So, Let's talk about some of those categories that we had talked about before that was really, you know, and you mentioned a little bit here when you're talking about like pulp and beer and paper and some of these things that yeah. I remember when you mentioned beer before, I was like, well, yeah, that's so obvious, you know, in any kind of the liquid consumer products, they're using water as part of that, right? So well, the key word so, there, Karen, is use. So all of us use water every day. Yeah. For for drinking and cooking and watering the flowers. We use the stuff to accomplish some other goal. And whether it's you at home or a steel plant that uses water to, to cool down the steel, to then the wastewater that comes out of it, they need to deal with it. But before you get to the users, let's talk about the suppliers of water, the source of the stuff. So if you want to understand water, here's my first point. If you're taking notes out there, you have to understand the source of water and who's supplying it. And then I will talk a little bit about, and I, I welcome to questions and, and get deeper on the source and the supply of it, it's utility basically. Then let's talk about users. And then finally, if you wanna make sense of this space, you gotta understand not only the supply of water and the people that use water, but risks associated with water. So those are the three sort of the holy trinity of water tech investing is supply opportunities relating to supplying it opportunities relating to using it and opportunities relating to um exposure to risk relating to water like a, a flood Th that that's a risk you're not using the flood and you're certainly not like supplying it to somebody you're just all this real estate is now damaged because of its exposure to the stuff Right. So that's sort of how we wake up as investors and try to create value and impact is by these things. So on the supplier of, of water. So, I mean, so what are utilities really selling us? They're selling us something that's free. I mean, you, you, your feed stock is totally free and usable the second you get it out of a lake or out of the ground. So yeah, pumping it to me and treating it to me, yeah, it takes some energy and takes some money to do it. But basically you're selling me something that is inherently free. So we all pay for water, but like the ability to raise rates on something that's free, if you're a utility in your town, you'll always be constrained to jack up the rates on water because you're getting this stuff for free. And it's immediately usable as oil is free. You get oil out of the ground, it's free. But to make oil usable, you actually have to do some complicated engineering to refine it and make it useful for our cars. So the first 
thing to understand here is that the industry of water is selling a free thing. That is a that is a, 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 an important point to note. Now, desalination, where you're taking salt out of seawater, it's pumping and membranes, that's not free, but they're competing against utilities that are getting something for free and selling it. So that's to understand how to invest in the space. You have to understand what you're dealing with. It's a free thing. It falls from the sky. It's in the ground. So you'll be able as utility to make a little bit of money, but like mm, you're always going to struggle to make some serious money in the selling of the stuff. Now, sellers of water utilities, they have inefficiencies. The water's not the right quality or there's not enough of it or they've got to go deeper for the well. So they need technology to get the water more efficiently and deliver it to the customers that need it. Um, so th there's, there's opportunities there, but our point of view as investors is it's not a very exciting opportunity to sell technology or services to utilities. Uh, people out there probably would disagree with me, but compared to the subsequent categories I'm going to talk about, utilities and supplying of is probably the least interesting um, space. It doesn't mean you can't make money and you can't generate impact in it. It's just from our perspective, our thesis. So the supply of the stuff, that's the first area. And there's a ton of deals and a ton of technologies that you can invest in. That's the first bucket. The second one is traditionally the biggest, fattest, most interesting bucket of opportunity in terms of water tech investing, users of. So who is the biggest user of water in the world? Agriculture, number one, by a wide margin. I mean, you can take shorter showers all you want, it doesn't really matter. Most of your daily water use is the water that was dumped on the fields for everything that's in your fridge. It's so abstract that people are like, what does that have to do with anything? Take a shorter shower and save water. If you want to, if you want to save water, become a vegetarian. <laughs> Meat is like the most water intensive thing you can do. And just try to have a water light diet. I know that seems super abstract, but the biggest user of water is ag. So ag has problems. What is ag's biggest problem? Not enough of the stuff, not enough rain, too much rain. Got to go deeper in the ground to pump stuff out of the ground. And it's expensive. You got to pump things out. So if you're a farmer, big or small, your annual headache is too little, too much. Quality is not a, such a big problem for you. You're just like a quantity issue. So technology companies can sell innovations in irrigation and more efficient use of every drop of water to get the same yield, including seed companies. So think about seeds and seed tech, they call it. So here's one seed that will grow you this yield using this much water. Here's another seed that will give you the same yield using 30% less water. That's an innovative, that's a technology breakthrough. And if you're a water tech investor and you're looking at ag, why not invest in seed tech that enables the farmer to get the same yield with 30% less water, which means 30% less pumping, which means savings all day long because pumping is energy. So ag is the first area and there's a bunch of uh, technologies there. I'm not going to go too long on it, but that's number one. And it has to be number one because it's the biggest user. And so that gets into kind of ag tech. The second area that we're, um, that we're focused on is buildings, building owners, you at home, me at home, school, office building, airport, building owners in real estate have a tenuous relationship with water. It leaks. It's not, it's too hot, it's too cold. Heating water is a tremendous amount of energy. And water is for almost any real estate owner in the world is a big problem. Flooding of your real estate or the, the leaks. I mean, the single biggest claim in the insurance business is water leaks, number one. So there's a bunch of technologies that create efficiencies for building owners, including you yourself, on leak detection, more efficient dishwashers and washing machines, more efficient um, pool management or backyard irrigation if you have that. Um, point of use, point of entry filtration. So there's like a monster industry around improving the management or functionality of water in our homes or schools or airports. That is so different than agriculture. It's fundamentally a different industry. And, and, and so if you want to go after water tech and water opportunities, if you know a thing or two about real estate, you might have a leg up on everyone because water and real estate, it's a, it's a nexus that 
is a, is, a, is a fascinating area of opportunity. Now, when it comes to point of use filtration, like the Brita filter or Pure or something in your kitchen, a refrigerator filter, we actually don't think of that as really water tech. That's more health tech. Oh. I mean, what, what's the purpose of a, a filter? Remove stuff. Remove what? Good things? Bad things. So filters essentially are just like health tech. And once you say health tech, all of a sudden people sit up in their chair straighter and they're like, well, you can make money in this. People's health. <laughs> so point of use, that's sort of at the use, at the kitchen sink or in your, that's where you use it. Or point of entry where in your basement or wherever comes in your house, you can put a filter there or softener. So the buildings is the second biggest chunk of users. And it's probably the most valuable water because we bathe in it, we clean it, or we brush our teeth in it. We're like using it to cook pasta. So it's different than agriculture, which is the biggest user. Buildings is more like the most valuable water, I would argue, because it's like in close proximity to our bodies. And would that be residential or commercial building? Oh, both commercial property owners have headaches. You at home have headaches. Sooner or later, if you own a property, you're going to have a leak somewhere. It's almost guaranteed. And so the tech, so this, I'll give an example of some of the technologies that are out there in building. So leak detection. So traditionally leak detection, you have to open up the pipe, put some sort of sensor in there, put some valve in there to, to monitor the flow. Later on, they came up with other sort of sensors to, 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 to monitor the movement of water. But the, the, the future of leak detection is, is using AI and machine learning to sense the movement or the sound of water to listen for normal, abnormal behavior in the water use. So for example, if no one's home in your house and the water is moving, so there's no one home, why should water be moving? Even if it's like a gallon a day, like no one's, so you get an alert on your phone that says there's something wrong. No one's home and water's moving, which means one of your toilets is running or there's a leak somewhere. So wouldn't you wanna know about that before it turns into a catastrophic event where it like, the pipe breaks and then your whole basement is flooded. So technologies that give you more visibility into use and normal abnormal behavior of water. Or for example, um, one of the technologies that we invested in Flume, they can monitor water use in your home. And if you're not home, I mean, a leak is one thing, but if somebody flushes the toilet, you get an alert on your phone that says someone broke in your house and used the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking around a little bit here, but like, so then it goes beyond just being conservation environment, that becomes a security tech. So if you're a commercial property owner, imagine you own an office building. Yeah. And the tenant on the 15th floor, some of them go up to the 16th floor, which is empty to use the toilets because it's quieter and cleaner and like everyone wants to go to a quieter, cleaner bathroom, but they're not allowed on the 16th floor because that's trespassing. They don't, that's not your lease, but they go up there anyway. So if you could put sensors on the 16th or just the whole building, but if you can see that every day there's like seven or eight toilet flushes on 16, <laughs> You send a letter to the, whoever runs this company on the 15th floor and say, you can't keep doing this because that's your trespassing basically. And if there's a liability or someone gets hurt or there's a leak. So that goes beyond just conservation and water and your quotes at the beginning that gets into building security and home security and health for the filtration stuff. So buildings, the next area, which is pretty esoteric and, and abstract is what you mentioned in the beginning about the pulp and paper and the oil and gas and the, Beer. So the third bucket is manufacturing, the making of stuff, the making of paper, the making of beer, the making of glass, the making of semiconductors. These guys use so much water to make their thing. Or, or the extraction industry of using fracking and water to get the oil out of the ground oh. or the gas out of the ground. So that's everyone's heard that's bad, but like they use so much water. And so there's, there's using water for some other goal. They wanna make uh, uh, some product that uses a tremendous amount of water. So some of the biggest users in that is pulp and paper and food and beverage and extractive industries like mining and oil and gas. So those guys have tons of inefficiencies and headaches and they pollute because they're usually the process at the back of the plant, there's wastewater and you can't just put that in the river, you'll kill all the crayfish. So you gotta deal with it, which means you need technology. So within industrial processes, there's a lot of monitoring tech about how much contamination's in my water on the way in, because if there's stuff in my water, the beer is gonna taste funny, or the pulp and paper won't have the consistency, or the semiconductor won't work because of all the metals that are in the water coming in will mess up the connectivity. And then on the back of the plant, 
if I'm dumping all this stuff in the river, I'll kill everything. I'll be fined out of existence by the EPA. I need to know what's in there when it finishes the process. So that's diagnostics tools. That's sensing presence of something in the water. So it's a quality challenge. And if you don't invest in it, you're going to be out of compliance and the EPA is going to be knocking on your door and you're going to get fined a million dollars. So those guys have a lot of headaches. And then within industrial, we put power plants. So people oh. have never thought of it before, but coal and nuclear within the industrial segment are the biggest users of water for cooling. I mean, you can have coal in your barbecue in your backyard and you get heat out of it. And that's sort of energy. But in order to get a turbine to spin, you need tons of water. Steam. And then nuclear, I mean, the problem in Fukushima, Japan was the water system went down. What happens? Meltdown. So you talk to guys in nuclear and coal, they will tell you in the very first sentence, the most important thing after coal and uranium is water. In fact, there's water industry more than they are anything else. That's why power plants are almost entirely next to rivers and lakes. So yeah. they, in industry, they call that water G because uh -huh. it's like two, two water energy nexus. It's like two industries kind of getting with each other. Um, so, and then uh, a, a couple more categories for people taking notes out there who want to invest in the space and laying it out a tractionable way to invest. So, so the, the next category is, 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 is of users is um, conservation. So conservation, so the Nature Conservancy and Sierra Club, they're using water to, to endow uh, nature with the, the water resources available for life to grow, for animals to grow. So they're still using it and they need technology. So within the conservation world, some of the technologies that are the most hot right now are satellite imagery and synthetic, synthetic aperture radar. So looking at a wetland or looking at a watershed from space and taking a high res photo and sending that directly to AI so that the computer will tell you something's changed or something's trending the wrong way. I mean, it's just like AI and the rest of our lives, if this, then that. So something's off. So the conservation com uh, community or the, is a big buyer of technologies to improve their use of water for fish and wildlife. So those are sort of the big users there. So to summarize a little bit, you've got the seller utilities, which is always fighting to raise rates and make money because the stuff's free. And you've got users that wake up every day, whether it's you and me or pulp and paper or conservation or a farm, water's a problem. And it's usually okay in our homes, but like look at Flint, Michigan. That's a big problem with lead. And so there's a lot of other cities with lead and arsenic and mercury and the Aaron Brockovich. The whole movie of Aaron Brockovich is all about hexavalent chromium coming out of power plants. Right. So that's, there's your nexus of health, water and power power gen coming together. So it's a huge challenge. So users, the, th the third and final bucket, which I think is the most, mm, probably the most compelling in the next five years is risk, is risk. So insurance companies, finance companies, and re REITs and real estate owners, they're sort of the Wall Street world. They're very concerned about water because what is the expression? Um, if climate change was a shark, the teeth would be water. So climate change isn't a shark, but if it was a shark, mm -hmm. the way we will experience climate change will likely be through water. Yeah. All of us. I so mean, it's not like a hot day, you turn up the air conditioning. Most will be too much water, too little water mm -hmm. in, our, in, our, in, our, in our supply chains, the users or in our lives, like our, my yeah. basement floods every summer now. Because fire and floods, fire and floods. Fire and so, well, if you don't have enough rain, guess what's likely to happen? Fires. Fire. So it comes back to water. And people are like, oh, it's more fires, more fires. Why is there more fires? Well, you know, it's just more fires. Mm -mm. Had the rain come, mm -hmm. like it usually comes. I mean, fires have been around for millions of years. Like that's not new, but it seems like there's more of them. Why? Less water. I, and I'm oversimplifying here. So. Who's the most interested in exposure to water risk? The finance, insurance, and real estate industry, fire sector, we call them. So that's Wall Street and, and finance people. They don't have direct water risk. They have, they're lending money or they're writing policies or they're investing in real estate and those assets have exposure to water risk. And so that could potentially be very damaging to their profitability going forward if they're 
lendies and their policyholders and their assets or their customers' assets have water problems. So the, the bank's insurance, they're looking for technologies to mitigate risk. So that's forecasting future water supplies. So that's near future precipitation forecasting, how much it's gonna rain, where's it gonna rain? And then how much groundwater is under St. Louis or how much groundwater is under Beijing? So the ability to, that's just leveraging technology to understand mm, what kind of risk are we dealing with here? We call it water security risk. So that gets into FinTech and InsureTech. So that's, everyone's like, oh, there you make money in that. So just to summarize here for a second, suppliers of the stuff, users of the stuff, and exposure to the stuff within each of those, there's tons of opportunity to invest in technologies that generate either social or environmental impact if you know what you're doing in the space and you know which company does what. So that's an oversimplification of it. But when we wake up in the morning, that's kind of how we see the world. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me ask you about that because, you know, you thank you for laying that out. And if, you know, one of the biggest areas, because when we talked before, municipalities are really slow to adopt change, which is in theory because of the way utilities are run, they're coming through government entities. And then mm -hmm. you have your users like the property managers, commercial, us, yeah, yeah, individual. insure, individual. individuals and all this kind of stuff. And then you try to, then there's another part of the government that tries to regulate it in order to be safer. But mm -hmm. sometimes it takes a long time for those to get put into place or sometimes the rules change, things aren't re-approved. So what was a rule of what you can dump in a river or not dump in a river changes, things like that. And so you kind of have this, you know, piece of it when it comes to, and I was thinking about this when I was preparing for this, you know, our big giant uh, dead hole in the Gulf of Mexico, right? That was, it's where it's the, it's our own little dead sea there mm -hmm. where yeah. contaminants uh, from pesticides and things from that from runoff from agriculture mm -hmm. have uh, basically created this. I think I saw it was like a 2000 miles area yep. of um, where nothing can live. And fish can swim out of it, but crabs and mollusks and all those kind of things just die. And so, you know, we as a government say, okay, no more of the, you know, draining of chemicals into the thing. There's like these regulations, but it's, you know, that kind of stuff. But then you also mentioned a lot about agriculture as having these pain, points of pain. So do, does the agricultural industry shift on its own? Does the the real estate development industry shift on their own because they start because the actual tables and the financial risk of this stuff start to say it it's better to invest in tech that can help you solve this problem or prevent a problem than to just keep trying to avoid change is there is there do you see that I know, happening I, I see where you're at so regulation of course matters and and it carrot or stick so if I if I if the runoff from my farm in Iowa is going to get me fined out of existence, I'm going to stop um, behaving that way, where I'm over fertilizing or I'm just fertilizing this way, and it runs in the Mississippi River. It's actually one of the big problems in the in the Gulf of Mexico is fertilizer, and nutrients, not only pesta, and it's part of it. But oh yeah, yeah. So for re regulations is part of the solution, but you know, in the United States we're a federal system, and the federal government is far away, and then the states try to regulate county tries to regulate but if you look at a map of the united states there's so much red on the map that is like you know politics aside it's like stay away i don't need any more regulations in my life in fact just smaller governments better so that's the in terms of just real estate most of america on the political map is red less got less like regulation less government that does not bode well for water it does not bode well for the water so I hate to be pessimistic, but as you can see in my comments so far, I'm slightly cynical about things. We live in a country that is, most of the rural America is just like struggling with regulation and they want less of it and they will do everything they can to get less. That does not bode well for the Gulf of Mexico and does not bode. Now it sounds negative. So there's another trend going on, which is Wall Street and all the banks and insurance and the land, they're saying, we won't lend you money 
unless you, you change your, um, your, your ways to be more environmentally sound farmer or building owner or manufacturing company. You have to demonstrate to us that your ESG, CSR, these, things, these goals, you're meeting these goals. Otherwise we won't, we'll lend you money, but here are the terms. <laughs> or we'll write you a policy, but here are the terms. And the farmer, the owner's like, that is terrible terms. It's like, well then go somewhere else. So then the market will just correct the behavior but then there'll always be a cheaper provider of, of, of insurance or money that the farmer can get it from someone who's just less right. So then regulations matter. So the market and the regs are constantly battling carrot and stick so that people just improve their, their management, their stewardship of the stuff. Yeah. Well, but like in some tech, like, so like on that example of the farmer, because that's such a huge consumer of this. And so if they had a system and they probably do, I mean, I, 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 might have mentioned this to you before, but my um, cousin-in-law is a old school farmer. Again, just just recently retired, been farming for decades and decades and decades. His own little spot, his dad, you know, whatever. Got hired up by University of Florida to run their research programs with PhD students that were doing that was funded by Del Monte and all these big ag companies to go and figure out like water conservation, what's the right amount of, um, of uh, fertilizer based on this to get the, mo the, the most yield, all that kind of stuff. And they, all these new technologies for water, they'd be testing them out to see what they were gonna use in, in big acting. So I thought that was really good because here's these guys, you know, investing in feel like, you know, trying out these basic things the you know these things to see what they could do on a large scale that would have a major impact and i have to think that the, when companies like that step up to do something like that they have done the math that says it's going to be better for our bottom profit line to go to do this stuff looking where the futures go and things like that regardless of regulation and it's the right thing so we'll be within the regulation is that and i i mean i want to be encouraged by that so is there corporates, corporates are doing that that trend is real the corporates are doing more. Technology is offering new tools to enable people to be more responsible, enable farmers or businesses to be more responsible with their water use. So the technology is catching up. Wall Street is definitely paying attention to ESG, CSR. That trend is not going away. Technology is getting better. The regulatory one, I'm not holding my breath. Yeah. I, and so, so within all that, um, the compassionate investor in me looks at regulations and looks at politics and I you know God bless people who wake up and are you know devoting their careers to civil service and and, and, and elected officials they it's a tough job because you're getting an arrow shot at you every day but I, I I can't make an impact through regulation and policy I don't think other people can do that and they should do that um, I'm not a corporate I don't work for a huge organization I can't make an impact that way all I can really do is identify companies that have innovations that drive efficiencies and offer, let's just talk about farmers or owners, a better way to manage their regulatory risk or compliance risk, or, or you doing more with less tools. So fortunately we live in 2021 and there's tons of tech out there that enables people to do more with less. So that as a compassionate investor, we're doing what we can, which is accelerating new tools that enable efficiencies. And, and, that, and that's that's social environmental impact investing at its core. And so in the absence of political leadership and a lot of the corporate stuff, to be honest, is greenwashing and like, blah, blah, you know, and they, 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 they definitely have programs and they do projects and they sponsor things. But I'm not really holding my breath too much for corporate um, eminence and leadership in this. They do things and they claim they, some of it's better than others and the regulatory environment. But that being said, corporates do pull technologies through and adopt things. So that's good. And regulations often do change. And policy out of DC, you know, they, if this infrastructure pack, package gets approved, it's a hundred billion dollars going towards removal of lead in, 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 in city and in lead pipes. So yeah. there's they, good, there's bright spots on the horizon. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, you know, I think that's, well, that's where you come in, right? Because it's, it's money that, that, that helps the innovation get to market. So somebody like uh, Del Monte or whoever, you know, 
uh, can test it to see if they want to scale it to implement all over the place because they're never going to invest in a seed technology. I mean, they do some stuff in R&D, but R&D is really, you know, taking something else right mm -hmm. from that, you know, better mind someplace else or working with universities that are doing something that, you know, you're also looking at a commercial opportunity for. So in our time that we have left, let's spend a little bit of time just talking about it, specifically what you're doing in Marazon to, or Mar Marazon. Mazarine. 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 Let me tell you, so Mazarine is a color. Oh, that's French. right. Mazarine blue. Uh, so when you were a kid, you had crayons. There was a color, there's burnt sienna, there was spring green, there was like navy blue, there was mazarine blue. And if you Google search mazarine and you do uh, and you do the uh, images, you'll see what mazarine blue is. Oh, okay. so we, mazarine, because we just thought it sounded. Yeah, it sounded, sounds like water. <laughs> you know, we didn't want to be too cliche and, and say water, aqua or H2O. And so we picked yeah. it Yeah, well, it's good. It's always had to, good to have a, a word that you can apply that you know visually also you know works with what you're doing right so so okay so let's uh i'm really uh talk about a little bit what what you're doing within mazarine labs what do you mean by skunk works and what mm -hmm. kind of uh problems are you do they do do entrepreneurs knock your door and say hey i see this is a problem help me figure out how to solve it or do you say you've got a business people or somebody saying you know we have this real problem can you find some technology out there that could help us you know solve these problems or is it both uh, both ways so uh, fortunately we have a lot of entrepreneurs uh, out there in the world globally who are solving problems in material science or data science or chemistry or electrochemistry or microbiology and they have a invention IP come out of universities and their postdoc. And it, it, it does something that could improve the efficiency of water. I'll give you an example. So material science, coatings, paint and coatings. We all kind of know what paint and coatings are. You put a coating on something to protect it. There's a lot of coatings that are uh, used to prevent fouling and scaling inside things or prevent rust or something or to make things smoother. So if it's yeah. a you use a layman's terms, if it, the inside of the pipe is smoother, less friction, that means the water can flow using less pumping, which means energy savings. So that's not water tech. That's not water investing. That's coat. That's material science coatings investing that just so happens to have applications relating to water, the pumping of water. And so corporates, so, so there's, there's a lot of technology and founders that have a thing that they've invented, but they don't necessarily know where or how the world uh, you could use it. So it's just an it's a it's an IP, but it's, it doesn't have any utilization potential yet because they don't understand. And then you have corporates that are hungry for the competitive advantage over their 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 rivals, and they're looking for early stage stuff that can give them that proverbial upper hand. But it's so risky going early stage. So Mazarin created something called Mazarin Labs, which we call a skunk works. And a skunk works is a traditional word that has been used in the aerospace industry to kind of mess around with smelly ideas, hence skunk work. <laughs> like not some of these ones are going to be smelly and some are going to get thrown out, but that's fine. Let's let's mess around with things and then the better ones will rise to the top. And so we've got our own skunk works where we're kind of fiddling around with some of these early IPs in codings or in some other chemistry or even data science. Is there a better way to measure this? And then on the other side of our desk, we have corporates who are hungry to look at things. And we say, we like this. We like the potential of this. And the corporate says, yeah, we will like that if X, Y, and Z milestones can be hit. And so we said, that's interesting. So from an investor perspective, we're putting money into companies. Sooner or later, we have to get an exit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put money in, and then we'll hit those milestones. And guess who's waiting at the other end of those milestones? Our exit. Good for them, good for the founder, and good for us. So, so everyone's talking about water problems, but like, what we need is an accelerant to get good ideas into market as soon as possible for the sake of society yeah. and humanity is water. So that's our skunk works. And so we're, we're, we wake up in the morning, we're spending more time with material science and electrochemistry and 
data science than we are um, water. There, I mean, there really isn't, I mean, if, you, if people say water tech, to me, that means adding electrolytes to water. Or alcohol <laughs> to water. Okay. Cherry flavored water, that's water technology. Where you're, you're adding more oxygen to water. You're adding something to water to kind of improve like the effervescence of it or like the oxygenated water. What we're talking about with a filter, like a carbon filter, like a Brita, that's just material science. I mean, activated carbon is basically just material science that people are using to filter stuff. So yeah. our labs is focused on these fundamentals of science and figuring out how to take those to accomplish something in those markets that I talked about before, the sellers of, the users of, and the exposure. Yeah. Now, the, the, the finance, insurance, real estate, the exposure one, that's mostly data science. It's mostly digital insights. What's going on right now with the river or the water or whatever. That's just like sensing and, and data ingestion and then decision support. So what, what do I do about that? How risky is that on a scale of one to 10? So it's the, the, the finance insurance real estate business is pulling hard on information technology and communications tech. So there's your Silicon Valley stuff yeah. with applications in water. Um, yeah, so yeah. we have a whole workbench in our labs that's focused on that. Okay. And then you have your fund one and fund two, and it's really interesting for a VC organization to even have something that does that seed level, which I guess is the focus of fund one, right? And then now, then there's always a struggle to go, what's the next round of financing? And so I guess fund two is for that growth. Fund two is just money. Fund two is just money. So the labs is intellectual capital. So what do we have here? That's just ideas. I mean, what is this important? Is this a value? That's intellectual capital. It's kind of important. We're also bringing human capital. I'm gonna spend a, you know, a few hours working on figuring out what to do with this and talking to some people. And then there's the most important type of capital all for really social capital. Getting Mazarin's endorsement or some other group's endorsement, social capital. That's really hard to raise when you're a young company. So our labs is doing these other kinds of capital Money's not the most important thing at the earliest stages. These other sources of capital are Our fund one is a combination of financial capital, fuel, and intellectual capital, strategy. And our fund two is just financial capital. Once you're out there doing a few million bucks in sales, you don't need mentorship or introductions really so much anymore. You've already figured out the market. People know you. Just raise a bunch of money to go out and sell more. So it's on a sort of a continuum between intellectual and human and social capital, a mix of capital. And then what most people think of when they think of capital, financial capital. So we live up and down that continuum and different companies need different types of capital at different times in their life. And knowing when to apply what type of capital um, can mean the acceleration of a company significantly um, rather than five or six years of just fiddling around and we see a lot of that. One of the problems we see is people who think they just need money. And we look at them, we think, <laughs> money right now. you don't need money right now. You need, you need like a strategic path to customer. And they're like, well, once we have money, we'll figure that stuff out. So yeah. No one's going to give you money until you have a, like a path figured out. And they're like, well, we'll get some grant money or whatever. <laughs> yeah. What we wake up to is, is, is a lot of these sort of forest floor where there's little things cropping up on the forest floor and knowing which is a which is a which is a beautiful little flower and which is a weed that's a kind of an abstract metaphor but like we're on the forest floor looking at these things growing and trying to figure out which one with a little bit of water a little bit of sunlight a little bit of nourishment can turn into something really nice and then which one is just a weed and should be picked right away I I think every investor and venture capital firm is trying to figure out which ones are the flowers and the weeds, right? Yeah. Or, or as my dad used to say, separate the, excuse my French, but he said, separate the chicken shit from the chicken salad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but one, one final thing I want to say, Karen, um, is that at the beginning of this talk, you talked about water being 70% of our body and water being 60% of the planet and water is like in everything, the ice caps, whatever. That your, your introductory remarks there is actually, uh, I'm sorry to be so so mean here, that actually is the problem, is that every time media introduces water, they trot out these yeah. advantages that are impressive, and people are like, uh-huh, oh, wow, wow, that's, yeah. It's a, it's a, and then after that, they talk about water is important, water is life, 
or the, my favorite, water's everything, which is factual. It's true. But then people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's important. It's yeah. you might, well, you know, a talk about honesty and trust. I mean, like, yeah, it's important. No, who's going to deny that water is important? Who's going to deny that honesty is important in, in our society? Yeah, yeah, it's honest. We need more honesty. We should value honesty. And then what do you do? You finish the conversation, people get back to their... So our, our point of view is if you want to understand the value of water, understand other things that are way more tangible to you and me or companies than just water. For example, if you want to understand the value of water, understand sickness. So many people die every day because of waterborne illnesses. Yeah. Like seven or 8,000 people a day. You want to understand the value of water, understand food. Everything in your fridge right now. If you understand the value of water, understand electricity. Turn on the lights in your house. It's a water decision for most of us, unless you have solar or wind. So it's by, it's by looking at, and flooding in cities, that's public health and safety. It's not a yeah. water problem. We've got a public safety crisis in our hands because it's like this water comes in and floods and like, and then that's a real estate and insurance problem. So our thesis as investors is put these other lenses in front of your investor eyes to look at water through the lens of insurance or the water through the lens of agriculture or food or health and you start to see dollar signs and yeah. you start to see impact opportunities to actually do something with your money that's good. But if you just talk about water, there's no traction for an investor in just water. Exactly. It, everyone's kind of an e expert in water. We all know what water is. So let me give you an example. I say water, of course you know what water is. You use it every day to shower and you use it. You're an expert in it. So it's like, what else do I have to learn about it? I know water is. So the people's minds close to the, the, the possibility that there's something more to learn there. Now, if I say cryptocurrency, <laughs> oh, cryptocurrency. wait, hold on a second. I got to listen to this because I got to read this article on cryptocurrency because I don't understand that. And I need to learn, oh, there's some investment things here. You say water, the mind closes down because I don't need to learn anything about water. I know water is. How are you going to, water, like, yeah, they're running out of it or something. On to the next topic. So if you want to invest in water, don't talk about water. Don't even look at water. Look at buildings, look at agriculture, look at manufacturing and the problems that those industries have where water is the protagonist. And that's, that's, as far as we're concerned, that's the only way to cut this. Because if you're just talking about water, you're going to be rudderless your whole investment career because it's like we're investing in water. Too, too nebulous of a term. Um, and so that's kind of my message to other investors is look at water through other lenses. I'll give you another example, di home dialysis machines. You've got diabetes and you use a home dialysis machine. Guess what one of your biggest risks is? Water you're bringing in from your tap. You yeah. gotta filter that stuff. And then it, the filters over time, they lose their, they get exhausted. The filter media inside the filter is not working anymore because you've been using it for six months. And then the stuff starts to get through and your dialysis machine goes down. You don't have a water problem anymore there. You've got a health problem. Yep. So once you think of it that way, the Baxters of the world all of a sudden become customers for water tech. And people in the audience are like, never thought about that before. Exactly, John. The that's like the government and they, this government was running out of it or something. Or like, <sighs> water, honey, take a shorter shower. So we save water. I know. That's the thing. That's the reason why I threw all those, those, uh, stats out at the beginning because that's what everybody hears and it's like it's so it it's so ubiquitous in so much of everything that i like i said these aha moments that i that you the first time we talked i was like yeah i had of course of course i hadn't thought about it like that but of course the most practical well, thank you for being better at, at really uh clarifying what the real opportunity is you know, compared to the noise in the marketplace or in the media, because that's that was the point I was trying to make with it's this. Fine whole too. The numbers you offered are fine. I'm not against them. They're factual. Yeah. They're true, and they're important to understand. Yeah. The, the the water is is everywhere, and it's important. But if you're a serious investor and you're serious about generation of impact, and you really want to deploy dollars into something that matters, and water seems like something that gravitates towards uh, your investment portfolio or your values. 
start to get serious about it by looking at the water as a protagonist in other industries, the key, a key player in the, in the, in the role in, the, in, in that industry. And you'll start to see opportunities to make impact and probably make a little bit of money along the way. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you'll have, uh, well, that's, you know, compassionate capital is as you choose to put your money and invest your money, that's going to have an impact in an area that's going to bring an innovation to the market, create a, uh, you know, create the jobs in that marketplace, cre- impact the economy or the community because of something that you have seen as a problem or something that you're kind of pa- that you're passionate about. And that's why I say what you're doing is so much that because you've chosen to saw to identify the water as this protagonist that, um, you know, other people's don't haven't put it through that filter. They haven't seen looked at it that way. They look at what is the pain point of a of a company that this piece of tech might solve, like your pipe example, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, they don't really think about, you know, oh, it's the energy costs of of flowing it through the time. Because I've seen some of that tech that's come through with, you know, better, you know, how you do the on the pipe stuff. And oftentimes it's uh, it doesn't get down to the to the the real level of pain of what you're talking about and what those uh, those entities, whether it's a municipality that is trying to farmer. improve their bottom in, line. In California farmer. right now, the farmers, if you just Google search farmer and California drought, those farmers are taking hundreds of almond trees out of production, cutting them down. Why? Not enough water to get almonds out of those trees. You might as well cut them down. So yeah. that's pain. That's pain because that's land that's unproductive. And those farmers are waking up. They're not thinking about conservation. They're not thinking about, they're thinking about putting food on the table for their family, period. Mm-hmm. So they don't have a water problem. They have a yield problem. And you think of it that way, then it's like, well, how do you solve that? It's like, well, how can you grow the same amount of almonds with less water? Or getting to the regulatory stuff, maybe the government should come in, the government of California and say, sorry, everybody, can't grow almonds here anymore. We just don't have no water for it. I don't care what oh, you yeah. want. But that's hard because the Central Valley, California is very conservative and like, don't tell me what to do. I'm going to deal your dreeper well. But like those guys in the Central Valley where all of us get our fruits and veggies, most of it comes from the Central Valley. Those guys are digging dr- wells that are like thousands of feet down to find oh, yeah. really old aquifers and depleting them within a few years. And then they do another one yep. and another one because they're just, I mean, they're just trying to do what all of us are trying to do, just trying to put food on the table for our families. And if the government comes in and says, you can't do that anymore, that, well, that was a left leaning you know, agenda. Like the, uh, the government's trying to tell me what to do. That doesn't fly in most of like rural America where the farms are. Yeah. So, well, California is unique in and of itself just because of how they had, they overall created their water rights and it's a mess. But then I remember, you know, when avocado avocados were all the rage there and which are don't consume as much water and then everybody seemed to shift over to almonds because oh we don't want to get milk from cows we want to have almond milk and we want you know and so there's you got to press a lot of almonds to get that much milk out of them you know or not milk it's it's white juice no it's (laughs) yeah they have another term for it but then california doesn't have a water problem we all have a water challenge because we all can like you go to the grocery store in ohio or new york all that, a lot of that stuff there is coming from California. And so like, it's something, there's a, there's a, for your audience that's interested in, in more sort of intellectual sides of this, there's something called virtual water, virtual water. And so that's the amount of water that went into making, I'll give you a very abstract example that will probably blow people's mind. So <laughs> glass, the glass manufacturing industry uses water. People are like, okay, I'm with you on that. I can kind of see how it's part of the process of like making the glass. So the glass that's on your windshield of your car and your driveway, the glass was, let's say, made in Monterey, Mexico. Okay, so it was imported. Great, it's making cars in Mexico and they're bringing it up here. So they're using water that's in Mexico to make that glass. And now you have a glass in the front of your car and your drive. So you're using Mexico's water for your car that you're using in Columbus, Ohio, or wherever you are. And so there's like water moving around the world virtually it's not physically moving water it's it's the use of the water somewhere else and you're consuming that water here 
Yeah. yeah. I know that's super yeah. abstract, but for the nerds out there in the audience, Google search virtual water and get nerdy on it. And the other one that's interesting is water footprint. So there's a bunch of websites where you can calculate your water footprint and it asks you a bunch of questions about how often you take a shower, how often you wash your dishes, you wash your car, and how much water you drink. But it turns out that your direct water use, showers, dishes, clothes, drinking, it's only like about 20 to 30% of your water use, depending on who you are. The rest of it is agriculture and energy. Yeah. So well, if you, know, you want to cut your water, energy and ag is how you can get the most wedges yeah. out of your water footprint. But that remains too abstract for people. They just well, think take showers. It's also big lobby groups because, you know, we get the message because of what we talked at the very beginning, like, oh, put a bucket in your shower for the drip so you can go and use that water <laughs> yeah, for yeah. something else. And don't do that. I mean, I've bought into that, you know, and you got places like uh, Nevada and Arizona and, and lots of parts of California and Georgia itself that it gets put on these water restrictions. You can only water your yard at certain days of the week and all these kind of things, right? Water in your lawn, but, that gets, water in your lawn is kind of agriculture irrigation. So yeah, that that yeah. is warranted. Less watering of lawns, less lawns, because that's kind of like ag where you're just like irrigating to get some, but shorter showers, actually one shower, you're not really talking about that much water comparing to irrigating a backyard. Okay, okay. The really yeah, is the irrigation is the problem. Yeah. My, uh, that's the biggest user. My sister-in-law out in California, she has a timer in the bathroom for people could only take a three-minute shower, right? And so, you know, but I'm just, but my point, the thing is, is that if agriculture is the biggest consumer, and like right now in Georgia, we've been in this battle with um, Tennessee and Florida over water rights coming out of our big reservoir, like Lanier. And, uh, and, and it's just been, I mean, we're talking decades, I think 50 years, this battle has been going yeah. on. And, but would you, would Florida or Georgia come together to say, we're going to adopt these certain principles and we're going to try to get our agriculture to start using like reclaiming and repurposing water, any of those kind of things. No, the government doesn't want to tell the farmers what to do. And so it's like, you know, they're the- so there's, they're there's an interesting book out there that addresses exactly what you're talking about. There's a book written by a professor at uh, Duke named, I can't remember his name right now, but he wrote a book called The Source, The Source. And the whole book is about the history of water in the United States and the federal government, going back to colonial times, going back to George Washington times and pre-George Washington times, and how the federal government, part of their existence is to mediate uh, interstate com commerce, which is traditionally on rivers or building the Erie Canal across New York and like between Kentucky and Ohio. And like, when you have two states battling over something, you need a federal government. So a lot of the federal government's history has been around mitigating and managing water in the West, in the Northwest, in the West, and even the Southeast. You go back to colonial times, Thomas Jefferson's and George, there was all kinds of water problems with commerce and moving things and who belongs to this water. So the federal government really has, it has a huge role in, in, in water. And it's part of like the federal government's role is to get in and, and, and govern water quantity. And then part of the Georgia, Florida thing is, is the contaminant, the water, the nutrients that are coming down and killing all the crabs in Florida. Right, right. Damaging and oysters, the oyster, Apalachicola oysters. Yeah, it's damaging people's livelihoods. So someone needs to come in and do something, but like who? Right. It's just we, and you know, we, if we're in Europe, it's a little easier for the government to come in and say, this is how it's going to, here are the rules. But the United States to come in and say, here are the road rules. People cross their arms and they're like, you can't tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> the history of the United States is, is very much like just fierce independence and, and liberty with a cap, like spelled in all caps. Like you can't take things away from me. And that's just the history of our, our country. So some things are kind of immutable going forward around, around water, but thankfully we have tons of entrepreneurs who are yes. coming up with hacks and, and innovation yes. to enable more efficiencies, do mm -hmm. more with less, and then better manage risk, which means seeing problems before they happen. So if you can understand how much water is used in Florida or Georgia or North Carolina and Tennessee, and you understand near future supply, this is what this reservoir is gonna be able to deliver over the next five years. And you have a high degree of accuracy around that number, and then you understand demand, you can use data to inform policy. <laughs> 
and and as they should, but they don't because the the data is often like best available, and it's like wow, the data. You know. But if you have more accurate data, high resolution data, you can start to make smarter policy decisions at the at the county level, the state level, the federal level. So really, that gets into better data uh, ingestion. There's just a high, more, higher quality data around water. And that should lead humanity to better manage, to be stewards of this. And what's the age old expression? If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. That gets yes. right into the heart of data science. And thankfully we live in 2021 where Silicon Valley has offered all these data science tools <laughs> yeah. to enable us to, um, to, to get visibility into problems before they happen. What's the likelihood this person is going to commit a crime? What's the likelihood this person is going to be, be you know, default on their debt? What's the likelihood that this is going to happen? That's all AI. And 20, 30 years ago, AI was not as mature as now. So I'm optimistic that through some of these data science tools, humanity can finally get out ahead of water quantity and quality problems to make sure that everyone has the water they need and at the quality that is, is for intended use whether you're farming or you're in your kitchen. So um, I think that right there, John, is the perfect point to wrap mm -hmm. up on. I don't can't. Is there anything you can think of that would be better than th that? So I can give you a sentence to, to uh, like an exclamation point at the end of this. Okay. The most, the most compelling opportunity in water is in data science. Exclamation point. Okay. <laughs> data that, science that, that doesn't make sense to you read it they should follow up with you or follow up with me and i'm happy to scrape on that for a whole day yeah i, I know i'm like going i'm looking at time i'm going like man we could just like i enjoy <laughs> talking about this stuff with you and um you know i'm a economics nerd that's all driven to me by data and predictableness of this stuff and there's so much when you look at these all the things that you've mentioned today that that are um, interrelated with that and with the use and, you know, handling of water, right? And I, I, I'm probably not right about everything. And, you know, we're investors, so we're going to get some things right and some things wrong. And our thesis is always evolving, but I'm happy to be a resource for anybody out there who has investment dollars that want to put them to work and co-invest alongside us or look at deals. And we're big on sharing because water is such an ex existential problem for humanity that, um, I mean, to a degree, our due diligence on things. I mean, we can't share everything we do with people because we're working hard to find deals and generate a funnel and doing due diligence. But if it's an investor that we have synergies with and we genuinely like and they're, and they're genuine, we're happy to share deal flow and share notes on companies and put money to work alongside other investors that share our, our worldview. So that's we're, we would welcome opportunities to, yeah. to partner with your, your audience. Terrific. And that you go to Mazarine Ventures again, M A Z A R I N E ventures.com. You can check out their investments and all the information that they have there. And also, there's a link on there directly to John's LinkedIn profile. So you can connect with him on LinkedIn as well. And if you're looking at our show notes, the link for the uh, Mazarine Ventures is in the show notes. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please share it with somebody. Please tell, please give us some likes or stars or whatever's on your page. And uh, I really uh, thank you for listening to the Compassionate Capitalist Show. John, thank you very much for being my guest today. And, uh, and everybody, for my own business, please go to karenrams.co. If you're new to investing, pick up the book, Inside Secrets to Angel Investing. And learn more about you know how you the process of how you go about that on the angel side and um, with that onwards and upwards. Thank you, everybody.